was stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within for the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship for it's all about you it's all about you jesus i'm sorry lord for the things i've made it when it's all about you it's all about you jesus It's all about you. King of endless words, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak, I'm poor.
When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Good morning. Are you ready to worship this morning? Wherever you are, put those hands together. Come on. With me now.
Well, good morning. Thank you for joining Christ Church of the Valley today, wherever you are. You found this, I like to say, little country church in the edge of town. But I don't know if we're a country church. We're just a church that wants to praise our Father in heaven, Jesus Christ. My name is Aaron Perlman, your worship leader here today. And just thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you will be blessed and encouraged by the words that we sing and we lead together as one. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and just ask for your blessing to take over today. May it be about you and not about us. We've already asked that you would take over the heart of worship, Lord, this morning. Now we ask that you be enough for us as we continue to sing your name. There are moments of weakness. There are struggles and pain. In the darkest hour, oh, he will never change. He's a light in the darkness. He's a calm in the storm. He's a shepherd to guide us. Oh, we are not alone. It's crazy. you to know that our Father in Heaven is right there with you right now. It doesn't matter if, you, if, if life has got you at the peak of things, there is still something bigger that you feel like the weight can still crash you down. If you're in the lowest of lows, He's there to meet you. His arms open wide, reaching out just to take you and lift you up. Christ is enough. Whatever cost, whatever whatever cost. Christ is enough. Say with me. Whatever comes. Whatever.
Christ is enough. Do you believe those words that he is? Christ is enough. His arms are stretched out open wide. Cause Christ is enough. Oh, we say and worship you. The Christ is enough. Oh, we believe, we believe it. The Christ is enough. These are the words we need to hold and say. Good morning, Christ Church of the Valley. So happy you could be here with us today, and I'm so excited about what God has for us today in learning to deal with losses in life. As we begin, I just want to start by uh, praying, and I want to pray for our communion, because as you'll hear today, it's through the losses in life that sometimes God brings new life. So is that appropriate and does that apply to communion you bet it does so let's pray and thank god for the loss that he was willing to go through so that we could have new life let's pray lord we thank you for this day we get to worship you and now we get to learn more about you and about how to deal with the losses in life and lord when we think of loss there's no greater greater loss than what you gave up on the cross how you allowed your son to be crucified so we can be forgiven. And because of that loss, new life has come to us. So we thank you, God, and we just give you all the glory for that. We ask you to teach us today and heal us, Lord. From the inside out, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you've prepared communion at home, I'd suggest at this time you go ahead and just recognize the the loss that Jesus went through so you and I could be given new life. Take the bread. And take up the cup. So we are not only having online services, but we're also having an outdoor worship service at 830 uh, every Sunday morning. And so if you would like to worship and take communion and fellowship with others, we uh, sort of sit at a reasonable social distance from each other. We're outside under some canopies. It's really quite lovely. So uh, go ahead and plan to join us on a Sunday morning if you get a chance. That's outdoor Sundays at 8.30 a.m. Also, uh, we have some special things coming up. We have a family dinner drive-by that's being put on by our children's and our student ministries. This is just a way of loving on the families in our church. So the student ministries, if you've got a, a child in the ministry or a, uh, a youth in the ministry, we want you to come by on September 25th, 5 to 6 p.m. They're going to give you a free dinner and some activities that you can take home and do with your family. So that's coming up. 
Also, our adult uh, ministries have been inspired by this, and so we're going to start curbside dinners on the last uh, Wednesday of September. Usually we have the grill on Wednesday nights, but we can't because of the COVID lockdown right now. So instead of that, our uh, volunteers are going to be preparing meals for you to, to, uh, to drive up, purchase, and then, and then take home with you, or you can uh, just eat them at tables out on our patio as well. So that'll start on September 30th. Also, we have a grief share uh, uh, ministry beginning. Uh, we've done this for a few years now, and the grief share program will, will launch on September 28th, Monday, September 28th. There will be a Zoom evening meeting, and you can sign up online. And a matter of fact, uh, it was this ministry that really encouraged me, uh, through my wife's leadership, uh, really encouraged me to get our speaker today to talk to us about losses in life. So let's hear about this program. Would you watch this short video uh, from two of the leaders of our Grief Share Ministry? Good morning, church. What a pleasure to be able to talk with you today about a worldwide ministry called Grief Share. My name is Rose. This is my husband, Roy. And we have been going to CCB for about four years now. And two years ago, Amy Stedman asked us to help facilitate this program at CCV. Now, Grief Share is a 13-week support group ministry that helps people heal from the pain of grief from the loss of a loved one. Both Rose and I lost our spouses years ago, mine from MS and Rose's from cancer, and we believe God has called and equipped us to walk alongside others who are grieving. This fall, we are pleased to host CCV's fifth session of Grief Share, but with a big change. We will be meeting online through Zoom, and for our first Zoom 13-week session, sign-ups will be limited. Hmm. Each Grief Share session has three parts to it. Small group discussions, workbook exercises, and video seminars. Now, these seminars feature real people who have experienced the loss of a loved one. And you will also benefit from nationally recognized experts such as H. Norman Wright from our own town of Bakersfield, who will help address the many issues you face. At this particular time, we have finished quarantining in Vancouver, Canada in order to be with our own family as we grieve the loss of my brother. If you are experiencing grief because of the loss of a loved one, we invite you to join us online on Mondays starting September 28th. Check out our Grief Share poster on the CCV website at ccvbak.com for, for more information. It would be such an honor for us to walk with you on this journey, on your grief journey, especially during this COVID time. We hope to see you there. I also want to say that I've been so impressed with our church lately. A couple of great things have happened. First of all, we had a blood drive, and I'm just so, uh, so thankful for the 25 people that were willing to literally give of themselves to give blood for the hospitals that need it so much during this lockdown time. Also, I want to thank the staff and volunteers who helped with the sidewalk sale um, a, a Saturday, oh, about eight days ago. Uh, they arrived at 2 a.m., they served all day. It was an exhausting day, but it was such a valuable, valuable thing for our youth ministries. I'll give you more stats and information later, but just once again, thank you to all those that served and worked so hard in, in the sidewalk sale, and also to those of you that, that donated items to be sold. It just was a win-win. Okay, today, uh, I'm really excited. Today begins our new sermon series on dealing with the losses of life. And, um, you know, all of us experience loss today and next week. We have a special speaker, Dr. H. Norman Wright. He's a well-known um, author. He's written, over, he's written 95 books, if you can believe that, 95 books. Uh, he's a very well-known uh, trauma specialist and Christian counselor, and he's going to be our special speaker today and next week. Then uh, the week after that, I will be bringing a message on dealing with losses in life. And then on October 4th, my friend Ken Campbell is going to be here. Ken was in a horrific car accident, was burned over most of his body. And uh, wow, did he experience loss in his life. He's going to talk about that. And then he's going to talk about how some of the things he was able to do as he overcame and he dealt with those losses. You will not want to miss that Sunday. That's October 4th. 
And I tell you, uh, again, Ken is an amazing man, an amazing story, and it will forever change how you view the losses in your own life. Also, uh, today, Dr. H. Norman Wright is here, and he has written 95 books. Here's just four quick examples. Experiencing Grief is a little book for those of you that have lost a loved one. Uh, When It Feels Like the Sky is Falling, How to Find Hope in an Uncertain World. When the Past Won't Let You Go, Finding the Healing that Helps You Move On. And then the one that really pertains to this series, Recovering from the Losses in Life. These uh, books will be available on Sunday morning here after our Sunday outdoor service. And also they can, they're available, obviously, online through Amazon, etc. Hey, I'm so excited for you to hear from Dr. Wright. So rather than uh, me going on, let me pray and, and welcome him uh, to share with us this morning. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this chance we get now to, to learn from one of your servants and to hear from your word. And we pray, Lord, that you would soften our hearts, open us, Lord, so we could receive what you have for us today. And through receiving this, that we could be healed and, and we could be uh, delivered and we could be rescued from some of the losses of our lives. Lord, for those that have experienced loss, I pray that this may be the first step today. If they haven't begun before, may today be the first step on their road to recovery. We thank you. We give this time now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you welcome Dr. H. Norman Wright. Thank you for the opportunity to come and minister at this time. And I'd like to take you out of Bakersfield for a little while to one of our national parks, the Grand Teton National Park. And it's one of my favorite spots. I've been going there for 25, 30 years. And um, one of the experiences we had, uh, my wife Joyce and I were fishing in the uh, Buffalo River. And she'd caught a couple of small uh, cutthroat trout. And then uh, I was just walking along the river with her. And um, all of a sudden, she stopped and her rod went down. She says, Norm, I've got a big fish. And I stopped and said, no, 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 Joyce, no, that's not a fish. You're stuck on a rock. No, 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 I'm not stuck on a rock. Yes, you are. Trust me, I'm a man. Bad thing to say. You should never do that. But then I watched and that rod uh, was going up the stream. And I said, you know, I think you're right. You've got a big fish. And so we finally cornered it and brought it out. And it was a beautiful 17, 18 inch cutthroat. And I was holding it and she said, oh, I want some pictures. But all the pictures of the fish you've caught, they're yucky, they're dirty, and they've got blood on them and everything. Wash it off. So I picked up that that trout and I went into the river and I started washing it. And as you might know, it lunged. And I knew I was a dead man because when it lunged, it got out. And yet, instead of swimming away, it just sort of floated. And she said, well, there, it's floating downstream. Go fetch it. And so I ran after it, and I missed it, and I fell into the river with my waders on and everything, and I'm just sputtering and getting up there. And she said, go get it. It's still floating. And so I went ahead and just I finally captured it and brought it out. And I looked up at my wife, and I was really kind of shocked at what had transpired because she was usually very quiet, reserved, um, and not saying a whole lot. She's up there jumping up and down and yelling and everything. Why? What's the difference? The difference was that which was lost was found again. And that is rare. It changed her personality in a way. But what about you? How do you handle things that are lost and don't come back? because that's what I'd like to talk with you about, because loss is a major part of our life. But we really don't talk about it all that much. It's like we have a a silent conspiracy and an unbroken agreement not to talk about losses, and yet every loss has the other side to it. It has the side of, I can learn something through this. I can be a different person because of this. Problem is, nobody, and I mean nobody, likes to lose. When a loss occurs, it means something is wrong and life is supposed to be filled with winners. I mean, look at the sports page and how that's focused on those that won and there's a little bitty section 
about those who lost. Well, losing hurts, whether it's a small loss or a big loss, but you and I, we want to be winners. We want success. We want to be able to grasp what's going on out there. But we have a sign that says, losses, no trespassing. And then if they occur, we feel violated. Um, there's a concept that loss means something is wrong and it comes over us into every area of our life. Listen to these statements. She must not have been a good wife for him to leave her. Or they failed as parents, otherwise that child would never left the church and wouldn't have become involved with that crowd. Or he lost his job. I wonder, what did he do wrong? Now, I don't know how you've responded to COVID-19, but I was reading an article in National Geographic, and here are some of the statements that this person said. We can't throw ourselves into shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder rescue work with strangers the way we would if we were digging someone out of earthquake rubble. Hmm. We can't funnel into houses of worship, or we can't yell together at the ballpark. For how long? Not knowing, trying to get to sleep every night and not knowing is one more hammer in our heart. The other statements were these. Our deepest human impulse for the giving and receiving of comfort, especially in a crisis, to move closer, to join hands, to feel the nearness of others. That's the one thing we cannot indulge. You know, there's a lot of difficulties with losses. If you lose a job at age 27, you simply look for another one. But what if your job is one you've had for 30 years and you're 57? What do you do when they come by with that pink slip and they say, thanks for your commitment, we're moving on? When the word loss is mentioned, death and divorce comes to mind. But there's other, there's other things too. What about the uh, diagnosis? That's very fresh for me because I'm struggling with some issues in my back and whatnot. And so whenever I go to the doctor, I think I'm a bit on edge because I don't want to hear something that implies a loss. Not at all. A friend of mine said, I went to the doctor. I thought everything was all right. And they said something about Parkinson's. What do I do with that one? Now we have all types of losses that occur, but threatened losses are some of the worst. Why? Because the likelihood that that can occur is very, very real. And secondly, many times there's not a whole thing, a whole lot that we can do about this. Um, losses happen not just as adults. They happen as children, adolescent, the adolescent romances, failing a grade, dropping out, leaving home for college, or just moving out. And as I mentioned, the physical losses, which I'm dealing with at this particular time. Maybe you've experienced a number of losses in your life. Some of you who are watching and listening might have had some losses and you weren't even aware that you experienced them. Some losses are gonna last for years. Some, you just sort of lost, you shrug it off. Loss is not the enemy. Not facing its existence is the enemy. There are many types of losses. Some of the losses are predictable. We know when they're going to occur. Some of the losses are sudden. And this is really difficult. When you experience a sudden loss, like in California right now, the fires that are just raging throughout the whole uh, valley at this time, they are dominating our life. And there are losses there that are so happening so quickly that we don't even have opportunity or time to get rid of what we need to get rid of or to move forward. Many times, loss is tied into a gain. There's an acquisition. I raise a lot of roses, and there's a lot of little buds that are there. But in order for those buds to go to full fruition, 
they have to drop the bud part and just expand. And then it turns into a beautiful rose. Remember when you were a child and you had some teeth and some of those teeth did not stick with you and you had to go ahead and get new ones? Well, those teeth were lost in order to make room for something that is permanent. Now, sometimes these get lost as well and they're replaced by false teeth. Graduating from high school, that is a mixture. It's a mixture of a time of delight and a time of transition. Here in Bakersfield, there are so many high school students who never had the opportunity to experience graduation, baccalaureate, and all the other factors. How do you handle a loss? Well, the way you handle it is accept it. Face it head on. Let it speak to you, and then you turn around and speak to that loss. I've had people come in for counseling and say, you know, what, what happened to me this week, I wrote a letter to the losses that had occurred. And I mean, I really wrote it a strong letter and I got into another room and I sat there and I just read that letter out and I yelled at the losses and boy, do I feel a whole lot better because I took charge of it. You know, sometimes we have losses that uh, are so necessary. I don't know about you, but I really enjoy eating lobsters, which happens about one every, once every five years. But those lobsters, if you look at them, they're the hard, hard shell. And they experience a major loss every year. They shed that protective shell and it makes them vulnerable to the attacks of all the sea creatures. And there's a real risk there, but there are two purposes for this loss and this time of risk. One, the mating process occurs and a growth spurt occurs. And without those two things, this species would remain stunted and eventually they would die out. Perhaps loss traumatizes us so much because it carries the message, you really are not in charge of your life. You don't have that much control over your destiny. You're at the mercy of whatever happens. Many of you who are listening and watching probably have experienced what many others have. You have losses in your life that you've never dealt with. Over the years, I've had a lot of people ask me, Norm, how do you know what to say when people come in for counseling? And I just say, I don't. I wait to hear their story. And once I've heard the story, then we can go ahead and can, we can work together. I remember one of the individuals that came in to see me. His name was Jim. And um, over the past 20 years, Jim had experienced five major rejections. Not one or two or three or four, but five, including some from his parents. And subsequently, he ended up feeling very, very depressed. In fact, he had clinical depression for about 20 years, and one year of depression is more than enough, but he had 20 of it. And we sat there and we worked together, and finally, we began to identify five major losses, five major rejections that he had never dealt with before. And so we worked through that. And we continued to counsel, dealt with a number of things. I referred him to a doctor because it was so serious that he needed to have uh, some support at this particular time. And so one day he came in and said, Norm, you know what I do on Sunday night? I said, I have no idea. Well, I go to the vineyard. It's a new church. And they do a lot of worship experience, in the, in the, especially on Sunday evening where they, they just get together and they pray and they worship and they cry, and you know what I do at that time? I said, no, Jim, I have no idea. I leave my family home, and I go up there, and I'm one of the criers, and I have cried my way through these rejections. I've cried my way through these losses all this time, and now they're starting to lift. And several weeks later, I had a conversation with Jim. and said, Jim, you're doing fine. You don't need to come in anymore. And he said, well, if I need you, I know where you are. Well, the weeks went by and came Christmas and his wife came in and I talked to her and I asked the typical question, how was your Christmas? Oh, it was wonderful. 
What did you receive? My husband. She received her husband because he reached into his life, tapped into the losses that he had experienced that he had never dealt with and was able to find the healing that he wanted. And my question that I've asked over the last 20 years to everybody that I work with is this question. What's the loss in your life that you have never fully grieved over? Let me repeat that. What is the loss in your life that you've never grieved over? Think about that. About 80% of all the people that have heard that have come back and said, Norm, I thought about it, and all of a sudden, I was able to identify what that loss was. And so as you listen, think back in your time. What about losses for you? Do you remember the very first loss that you experienced? I do. I was five years old and I went, went to a sort of a country school because we lived up in the hills of Hollywood. And uh, I caught this gigantic grasshopper. I mean, he was huge. He was the super grasshopper of all. And I took him to class with me. And when it was time to go home, I went to get my grasshopper and somebody had taken him. That was my first loss. Sounds strange? Maybe. But to me, where I was as a little boy, that was important. But what about you? What's the loss that you have never grieved over? Because many people are just stuck today and not able to move ahead. Let me take you back to the Grand Teton National Park. Went up there for about 25 years in a row and we did a marriage enrichment seminar for a number of years. And I was hiking with a friend of mine by the name of Don. We were going along the river. And we came to where there was an inlet hitting the main portion of the river. And so Don went up one way and I went and I stood right where the two little rivers converged. And I fished for a while and I caught a couple fish and decided it was time to go on. And I went to uh, get out of the, um, the river and went, mm. I went, mm. I was stuck. Literally, I was stuck. And I yelled to my friend, Don, I'm stuck in the river, in the quicksand. And he said, see you later. And uh, that was our way of interacting. But he came back and we both laid down on the, on the sand because it was a mixture of quicksand and sand. And we began to dig it out and dig it out and dig it out. Some of you are still digging. You've never confronted them. Some of you need to dig it yourself out because it's impacting your life. But as a family, this next week, I encourage you to sit together as a family, do some thinking, maybe write it down, and share one or two of the losses that you've experienced in your life that maybe you still need some help with. You might be quite, quite surprised. People have asked me over the years, Norm, is there any real purpose in loss? Does it really make that big a difference? I want to look at the word of God at this time. In James chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, it says, Count it or consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. For the trying or testing of your faith produces endurance. It's interesting when you look into this, look at the words consider or count, it can mean an internal attitude of heart and mind that causes the trial and circumstance of life to affect us either beneficially or negatively. In other words, you have a choice. And what will you do with that choice that you have about the losses in your life? You see, with this verse, there's a decisiveness of action, not a passiveness giving up. In fact, it could mean make up your mind to regard adversities as something to welcome or be glad. Wow, that's, that's pretty strong, isn't it? Make up your mind to regard adversities as something to welcome or be glad. It's basically, it's an attitude. People have asked so many times, what can I get out of a loss? What can I learn out of a loss? Uh, what is there for me? Let me share with you several. 
First of all, loss can strengthen our faith. Do you notice the emphasis that I put there? It can strengthen our faith. It's not automatic. It's not, I'm just going to do this and go on. No, the reason the loss is there is for a purpose, to get our attention that maybe something else is going on in our life and we need to listen to the message that is there. Loss can produce maturity. You know, you look into the book of Romans and it talks about the various character traits and everything. And we need to look at our life in light of those scriptures because there's something there for us. A third purpose, in a sense, as we suffer, we enter into the suffering of our Lord and become more Christ-like. When is the last time you looked at the scriptures and you looked at the word of God and saw that it's saying, I want you to reflect my son Jesus in your life. Listen to the loss. Listen to what I have to say to you. Fourthly, when you experience loss, you will discover the extent of the comfort of God. He has comfort for you. You might not know it, but it's there. And then God can use what you've experienced to help someone else. Much of my life has been around loss. We've lived with loss in our family for many, many years. Let me give you the background. When I went to Fuller Seminary, I didn't know that uh, you should not go to the professor and announce to the professor that you don't know what to write a thesis about and they're going to assign you one. That's exactly what I did. And they said, Norm, sit down. Let me tell you what you're going to write on. We want you to write a thesis on the Christian education of the mentally retarded child, of which I knew nothing. And I went to schools and classes and I read books and I went to other courses and whatnot. I graduated from the seminary and went on staff of a church, a very large church. And during that time, I also took another degree at Pepperdine. And in order to get my school psychologist credential, I had to spend several hundred hours working in the school district. And I was assigned the task of working with what they called then mentally retarded children. And then the church where I was serving, they decided to have a ministry to the retarded as well as their parents. And so they said, Norm, let's take a look at what we can do and see how, what we can do to, to help others. And I knew what was going to come, come around. They were going to say, Norm, you're in charge of it. You take care of it. And that's what I did for over a year. I worked with the children and I worked with the seniors, the parents. And one day, my wife and I were sitting there talking and they said, and I don't know whether it was she or me, but one of us said, isn't it so interesting that we're having so much exposure to retarded children? Could it be that God is equipping us and preparing us for something that's going to happen in our life later on? Huh. And that's about it. That's all we said. Within a year, we had our second child. And his name was Matthew. Matthew appeared a little bit different at first, a little bit slow. And Joyce came to me one day and said, have you noticed how when we walk through the room that Matthew doesn't look at us, he doesn't um, track with us? And I said, well, it's no big deal, he'll catch up. And so we kept saying that, he'll catch up. But then at eight months, he had his grand mal seizure. And if you've never seen a grand mal seizure, it's pretty terrifying. And so we put Matthew under the care of the UCLA uh, medical staff and they evaluated him and they called us in and they said, would you like to sit down? We've eva evaluated your son and the best we can say is that for some reason his brain did not function properly or not form properly. And because of that, he will never be more than a two-year-old mentally some year. And then for some reason, there was a brain defect and something happened to his brain, which accounts for the grand mal seizures. So all I can say is someday he may be a two-year-old 
Someday he may not. And we were sent home with that. And that was the beginning of our travels with losses. Because every day there appeared to be some new type of loss that we'd never seen before. But we did not want to be like the majority of families where when they have a disabled child, they end up in divorce. We said, we're here for the duration. We're here to be the ones that Matthew changes and we change him as well. It was interesting. It took me about over a year to come to grips with what was going on with our son. And I remember the night we were watching a, a movie on TV. Some of you might remember it. It was called Then Came Bronson. And it was about a fella who traveled throughout the US on a motorcycle. And this one program, he was uh, at a ranch for autistic children. And he was assigned an autistic child. And uh, the child could not speak. And his life was nothing but loss after loss after loss. And at the end of the program, this little boy who was autistic looked up at Bronson and said one word. And that one word was a trigger that got to me. And I had not yet cried for my son. And I got up out of the chair, went to the kitchen and began to weep. And that was the beginning of my son's ministry for me, not me for him. Because my son taught me how to cry. My son taught me to have a feeling vocabulary because I was like many men, raised emotionally disabled. We didn't know what to say, we didn't know how to say it, and we didn't know how to deal with the feelings or the emotions that were there. And so, that's what Matthew did. He helped me to become fully human, fully a man, because I learned a feeling vocabulary. And Matthew, in spite of his limitations, in spite of his handicaps, he ministered to us in our family. He ministered because of losses. And so I ask you, what are the losses that you have never dealt with? What are the losses in your life that are still controlling or dominating? They're still having a negative effect. What loss in your life needs to be confronted? And what loss in your life needs to be given, given over to our Lord and Heavenly Father? Because loss, it's gonna be with us folks the rest of our life. You see it around. Our lives have been changed already because of the disease. And there's going to be more losses and they will continue. How will you deal with them? How will you handle them? I was working on this message and I came across something that uh, my granddaughter wrote several years ago when she was going to the Christian school. She was probably in about fourth grade. And um, I was looking at loss and looking at, because she's experienced quite a number of losses. She lost her mother several years ago. Two and a half years ago, she lost her father. And relatives didn't really know what to do with her. So they took her along back to Alabama for about six months and then came back out here. And I became the guardian. And she's had an impact on my life, the lives of others. And I found something that, um, that she wrote. And it's something for you just to think about. That doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the loss. And yet, maybe it does. I guess they were writing creatively in the class at Stockdale. And they were asked to write something about their home. And this is what she said. Our home is where we live play and sleep. It doesn't fall when we jump or leap. It keeps us warm and safe at night, during the day always bright. The floors may creak and the doors may squeak, but it won't fall down. It can be one of many in a town. It can be any color. 
even blue, but none of these things should matter to me and you. God should be the first thing people see. You could even consider God the key. If God isn't in your home, it's empty. God gave his son Jesus for you and me. He loves you for you, so accept him into your home today, for he is the light, the truth, and the way. When you face a loss, remember the extent of the love that God has for you. And as you move through life, learn from your losses. Let them be your teachers and grow in his sight. Thank you for listening. Sun and moon declare your name Mountains show your majesty Universe it shines your mystery Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. My King. Cause you're the waves that crash my heart. Sinking fast, my sin departs. There's a hope that sets my sail upon the shore. Jesus, you're my foundation. You're my rock. Yeah. Jesus, I love. I love you, Jesus. I love you, my King. Jesus, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you. Jesus, I love you. 
Jesus, I love you, my King. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance. That means to give you a big, fat, beautiful smile and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen.